Thanks everybody for joining us for this month's COP call. Um, we have over the next few months, um, we'll be doing things a little bit differently on the COP call. We'll be having updates from folks on the research presentations that we've uh, funded through science applications program, partially as a result of this collaboration. Uh, but we'll also have some time for updates. I know today there are a couple of things additional on our agenda uh, that we'll go through. Um, Looking at the list here, I don't see many new folks. I've a little lost track a little bit the last few months, but if we do have new folks on the call, feel free to drop a chat in here and let folks know uh, who you work for um, and maybe where you sit. That would be great. And um, I think without um, delaying any farther, um, Christina, their housekeeping things before we just go into the intro. I don't think so. I think we're good. Okay. Cool. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Let me clear my voice and I'll sound very official here as we get the recorded part of this going. And then uh, Tom Gregor will hand it over to you. So uh, you all can feel free to tune out for the next minute or so. Um, Hello everyone. As you probably know, my name is Matt Graybaugh and I'm the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Avarice Species Coordinator for Arizona and New Mexico. Um, for almost two years now, I've been working with the CCAST team, uh, which includes Christy Miner, who you all see here, uh, Genevieve Johnson from the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and I got, yeah. And uh, Alex Caberly before Christy was with, uh, was with us starting uh, early last year. Uh, to facilitate this community of practice. Um, pretty early on, even before the official community of practice launch, we invited um, many folks here uh, from federal and state agencies to come together and help us identify some high priority research needs that we could put some funding toward early on to kind of boost this work. Um, as a result of that, uh, the science applications program is funding four projects through the initial competitive announcement and also providing support for two ongoing projects in Arizona. Uh, one of those is assessing impacts of bullfrog control, and the other is assess assessing a natural fish barrier in the Grand Canyon. Um, each of these projects have been up and running for about a year and a half. Um, so we've asked at this point for the project teams to come together uh, to the COP, um, present updates, which we'll host for the next three months. And with that, I think I'm ready to hand it off for our first presentation in the series. Um, and today, Tom Turner and Gregor Hamilton will be talking to us about the project entitled Population Dynamics and Community Interactions of Invasive Crayfish and Protected Fishes and Reptiles in the Gila River Basin. Um, so Tom, Gregor, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks, Matt. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just quickly introduce myself and then turn it over to Gregor, who's gonna give the presentation. Um, but uh, I'm Tom Turner. I'm a professor in the biology department at UNM. And I'm also the curator of fishes uh, in the Museum of Southwestern Biology at UNM. Um, and uh, I just want to add a little bit of a plug here. Uh, a lot of the work that you'll see that Gregor's presenting is also contributing specimens to the museum and, uh, and is going to contribute, I think, both information that's going to be super important for management. And then in addition to that, this long-term resource, resource uh, for science and for future stuff. So. I'll leave it at that, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end or during if, if I need to, but Gregor's going to take over from here. And Gregor, you're muted, by the way. There we go. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, and so, yeah, so here I'm going to recap uh, what we've been up to over the last year, uh, year or two. Uh, on my research or our research in the, in the Gila on non-native crayfish impacts. Uh, so we have four main project goals that we outlined uh, for this funding. And um, so they're one, to assess the population structure, reproductive technology of crayfish uh, in the Gila, identify crayfish food web connections uh, with suppression reach experiments. We wanna quantify the magnitudes of crayfish interactions in the food webs. Uh, and lastly, we wanna scale this up to landscape uh, effects of crayfish. Um, the first three of these goals is going to take place uh, at the Tularosa River in Catron County, New Mexico, at the Hell's Hole site. Uh, we picked this site uh, because it has several um, 
T&E species of concern uh, that live there, both fish, uh, reptile, amphibian. Um, and there's no other established populations of non-native uh, species there, no bullfrogs, uh, no centrarchids to speak of. Um, and so it made a pretty good study site to understand just crayfish interactions uh, and their population through time from research from like Bruce Christman and, and uh, Randy Jennings shown to be pretty variable. So it seemed like a good uh, setting. And then lastly, for the fourth one, we're gonna look at 12 sites across, uh, across the upper Gila Basin over a 10 year span with uh, data from collaborators at Kansas State University and New Mexico Game and Fish uh, and, and Tom Turner's lab. So to start with, uh, the first few things we looked at uh, out in the field here were population structure and reproductive phenology. Uh, first thing we did was conduct a mortality study so that we could uh, understand how inserting pit tags into crayfish uh, affects the mortality based on the size and the sex of the crayfish that we're inserting and on the location of the insertion. Um, and then so that we could understand mortality rates in the field from crayfish that we pit tagged uh, for later studies. Um, and then we, as part, of, uh, as part of the food web study, we got an idea of population structure, which we um, wanna include here. So this first section is really geared towards uh, helping people, managers understand uh, how to incorporate uh, survey techniques for, uh, for their own interests. Um, and then we uh, wanna, uh, present some fecundity data on females uh, with eggs that we uh, conducted this last fall. And then lastly, look at male reproductive status through the season. Um, so first, this pit tag mortality study, uh, we conducted two trials where we inserted pit tags into three different locations on the crayfish. Uh, and we uh, conducted logistic regression models uh, to understand the size and the sex contributions mortality um, in these groups. Uh, long story short is that the central insertion was the best um, and most reliable. And our study agreed with a few other studies that found that the smallest carapace length that you could really safely do is about 20 uh, millimeters, which is a young adult near a reproductive age. Um, uh, one of the mo motivating factors for the study is that other studies out there look at these other insertion locations, but have only done them in lab settings and haven't compared them to other insertion locations at the same time. So we wanted to use this in the stream and get as realistic a data as possible for our study. Uh, we're pretty close to having a manuscript finished with this and it should be submitted within the next month or so. Um, uh, next population structure over the two year period that we've been out there. Um, this is a pretty interesting result and I think Matt Troya's work is probably gonna shed a lot of light on exactly what's happening here. Um, I have a pet hypothesis that the flow regime uh, that we've seen over the last few years is contributing uh, uh, to a reduction in, in recruitment of young crayfish. Um, and you can see, so in 2020, uh, a growing population would have a strong base in the pyramid um, and a top heavy, indicates that there hasn't been recruitment. And so we see this top heavy uh, pattern here in 2020. In 2019, there was a really strong monsoon and a scouring flood at the site. And in early in spring 2020, when I got there in early March, there was still a flood pulse from snow melt that was over bank. Um, and based on other data that we have through the season, really seems like the young crayfish are out and about in the emergent vegetation on the side of the stream, the marginal vegetation. Seems like they might get knocked out uh, with these scouring floods. Um, and so there is a little bit of a hope that if you've got a site that floods for a few years in a row, you can really knock back the crayfish population because these are only living for three years. Um, and so a few years in a row of knocking back that recruitment, uh, there's maybe a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel there. The bad news is, is when you even have one year in, in, in the middle of that, that doesn't have a good monsoon, then the recruitment really ramps up. Um, and I should note here, this is only including crayfish that we could identify the sex of. Sometimes it was too small or we had too many in the field uh, of these larval crayfish that we couldn't sex them. So the base of this pyramid is really much out wider. Um, but there wasn't a scouring flood in 2020 of monsoon and there wasn't any uh, overbank flooding from the winter snow melts in 2021, the spring snow melt. Uh, and we saw a ramp in reproduction here. Um, so pretty interesting results on that one. 
Um, we also conducted a female fecundity study through our trapping efforts. So any, any females that we removed from the suppression reach um, we, that were gravid, that either had eggs or larvae attached, we set aside uh, and collected them and counted those in the fall, any that had eggs attached to them still. Uh, and um, I'll present those results. Oh, yeah, here we go. So the crayfish that we brought back and analyzed in the lab, a total of 45, um, had an average of almost 270 eggs per female. Um, and based on the larvae that we found on females, uh, it seems like most of those come into fruition. Uh, pretty large standard deviation though. So there's, there are several uh, smaller ones that uh, had a lot of eggs, several bigger crayfish that didn't have very many. Um, it seemed like mass was a better predictor, or I'm sorry, uh, carapace length is a better predictor of fecundity as well. Um, one interesting thing to go back to this slide is that we found 254 females total through our study, through our trapping efforts that were uh, in glare, meaning they were reproductive with eggs or larvae, but we found over a thousand post-reproductive females and a lot of those were later in the season after it seemed like most of the reproduction had happened. Um, and so our working hypothesis with this is that the female crayfish really hang out in the burrows, aren't very active during the early part of the season when other crayfish are starting to get active when the water temperature warms up um, and that they come out and, and move quite a bit um, on the landscape. They, they filled into our, uh, our suppression reach really rapidly and in large numbers. Um, in, in May and June. Um, that was sort of bad news for the idea of suppressing crayfish because if, if you wanna really curtail uh, reproduction, you gotta get these gravid females before they, before they uh, release their larvae into the stream. Uh, but if they're not, not out and about, if they're hunkering down in burrows, that makes it kind of a tall order. Um, lastly, uh, the male reproductive status, um, so crayfish, Male crayfish have two forms that they uh, oscillate through their life cycle in one year. Um, and so they'll be in a reproductive form, which is form one. Um, and you can tell this by their gonopods, what it's called, their modified swimmerettes uh, at the base of their cephalothorax. Um, and if they're in this light feathery long form that you see here in the top right, that means they're reproductive. If it's a short stubby club-like, that means they're non-reproductive. Uh, we're still collecting this data uh, from collected specimens. Um, and so this is just a, a mock uh, goal figure that we have here. Uh, what we expect to see is, is as you get through um, uh, April, May, that you'll start to see them switch and not be in reproductive mode. Um, and they'll go back into that in the late fall. Um, sorry, I think my computer froze. Okay. So next steps uh, for this first section, uh, we wanna refine those population pyramids. So I have that data going through on a weekly basis. Um, and so we can get a good idea of when, uh, when reproduction is ramped up or when recruitment is ramping up and uh, get an idea of abiotic factors that might contribute to that. And also see what the uh, demographic response to suppression, which I'll talk about next, uh, how that looks. Uh, we're close to submitting the mortality manuscript for the pit tag insertion. Um, and then lastly, we want to finish the male reproductive status and then figure out a, a good journal that management folks uh, look at to disseminate our fecundity data. So the second aspect of our project is to identify the food web connections uh, through this suppression reach experiment. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to do uh, is, well, I'll explain briefly. Um, our, our suppression reach experiment is conducted at the Tularosa site. We have a 275 meter reach of the stream uh, that directly is directly downstream and abuts another 275 meter stretch of the stream uh, where we're removing crayfish from. So we have a control reach downstream and a suppression reach upstream. Uh, we conducted three different kinds of surveys uh, and removal efforts. So we put guillemot traps into the stream every other week for uh, anywhere from uh, one to four nights. And then we conducted three um, dip net surveys and then two electrofishing surveys. 
to remove crayfish and also to quantify uh, using three different methods, quantify crayfish population between the two reaches. Uh, the goal being to suppress crayfish population uh, enough in the removal reach that we can get a food web response using stable isotopes uh, at the end of the season. So the first thing that we did for this is to construct a uh, an uh, allometry data set. Um, it was not feasible to weigh crayfish in the field. Um, and so we came up with a, a, a quick and dirty method of measuring crayfish using a ruler to the nearest millimeter, or nearest half millimeter, pardon me. Um, and then later in the lab, we uh, constructed this allometry, sex-specific allometry, to be able to predict biomass, estimate crayfish biomass. Um, these came out pretty tight. Um, I was excited to see this. Um, and so uh, the plan is to use this data now to estimate biomass in, the, in each reach and get a biomass-specific um, uh, estimate on our, on our response variables down the road with those stable isotopes. Um, another thing you see here is total length to carapace length uh, allometric equations for each. Um, in the first year, we measured total length of the crayfish. Uh, and then in the off season, uh, I read a couple of papers that said that that was a little bit more variable and less reliable than measuring carapace length. So we switched to that for 2021, uh, but found a really tight relationship, which is good. So our, our data is comparable between the two if we apply this equation. So that's step one for this. Uh, Step two is to kind of explain and outline our uh, stable isotope system that we have here. So we're, we're using stable isotopes, uh, a carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen system uh, to understand the niche width, uh, niche occupancy, occupancy of the different members of the food web. And the first step is to see how good of uh, discrimination you have between your primary producers. Um, and so I'll go through briefly, I know not everybody's familiar with stable isotopes, just make sure we understand what these different axes are showing. Um, so carbon is used to understand the differences between primary producers mainly from three different photosynthetic pathways. Um, and so on the far right, the heaviest isotopes, you'll have uh, C4 grasses. Um, on the far left, you'll have C3 plants, most of our trees, uh, a few grasses and uh, forbs. And in the middle, um, you tend to have different kinds of algae. So we have two different kinds of algae. This worked really well for our system, which is great. Uh, two different kinds of algae that separated out here in the middle. Uh, C4 grass that was uh, a marginal grass that actually threw rhizomes out into the uh, stream and had emergent grass coming out. So it was definitely available for our food web. Um, and then here we have a lot of riparian um, C3 plants. Um, so the goal is to have good discrimination here. We got that, that's great. Um, and then we also, look at nitrogen as a trophic indicator, the higher you are, uh, the higher your nitrogen values, the higher you sit trophically. Um, and then we also have these ellipses here. So these ellipses uh, represent the diastolic niche uh, space uh, of that organism or this functional group as the case may be. Um, so something here is that the larger this is, the larger, the more generalist that group or that species is. Um, and you would expect something like crayfish, this is our first really cool result, something like crayfish to have, occupy a very large niche space here because they're omnivores. And there's this prevailing notion that um, young crayfish eat a lot more, or they range on the more carnivorous side of the spectrum of omnivory versus older crayfish uh, ranging on the more herbivorous side. So you would expect a big difference between this um, or, in crayfish, but we found a really tight isotopic niche space. There wasn't much variation in that. And I'll dig into that in a little bit, a little bit more. Um, one thing that's missing here, and this is our 2020 data so far. So this is the very first data that we got back before COVID uh, shut down labs for a while. And then this field season happened. Uh, we're getting back into data getting submitted again. So we'll have updated the rest of 2020's data and then all of our 2021 data coming out in the next couple of months. Um, but the invertebrates are the real response variable here. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to seeing how, uh, how that plays out. The other nitrogen or the other isotope we're looking at uh, is hydrogen. Hydrogen is really good for a stream system, especially if you're interested in understanding connection between riparian and in-stream food webs. Um, the really light hydrogen down at the bottom is, tends to be more in-stream production. The really light hydrogen 
or heavy hydrogen at the top tends to be out of stream production. There are a few macrophytes that kind of defy this rule, but in general, all of the algae, all of the um, floating particulates and things tend to be really, really light in hydrogen. So you can tell if uh, resources that move their way up through the food web were derived from in-stream or out of stream with the addition of hydrogen. Uh, and this was a really good addition because as you can see, several things uh, discriminate on the vertical axis here. Um, it's hard to illustrate three dimensions in one go, so I, you can't really see this, but with the addition of hydrogen, we end up with every single one of our functional groups, especially our primary production, is completely discriminated from, from the others. So that bodes well for the addition of, of invertebrates. We can really see what invertebrates sit where and then how they shift with the shifting crayfish density. So this is hydrogen and carbon, um, and you can see it's not quite as, uh, there are several groups that overlap here, but in general, we also have on the carbon axis discrimination going up with hydrogen. So I'm gonna dig in a little bit to some of the crayfish results that we've gotten so far. Um, we found that there isn't a difference in sexes um, and where they sit isotopically. So there's, there's no difference in the diet of male crayfish and a female crayfish. Um, and we also found contrary to what we expected, that there wasn't a difference in trophic position of crayfish based on their size. So it seems like large crayfish, small crayfish are in general eating at the same trophic position. Um, we did find an interesting result that larger crayfish tend to eat more riparian derived resources based on the hydrogen access. Uh, and we're hoping to dig into this a little bit more when we get 2021 data in. Um, this is again, just from 2020, but this is an interesting result. Even though they don't differ trophically, they're differing in their hydrogen resource. Um, so getting to what we, what we were heading for or what we were working towards as our response variable or our predictor variable, uh, achieving a lowered crayfish density in our suppression reach. In 2020, uh, we removed 896 crayfish and over 2,200 trap nights uh, between March and June. Uh, that was out of a total of 1,970 crayfish uh, that year. So there weren't very many crayfish in 2020 at all and removed uh, about half of them. Um, in 2021, uh, there were almost an order of, mag order of magnitude more crayfish. Uh, and uh, since we varied our survey techniques in this year, we have fewer trap nights, um, but we also had these dip net, sur dip net surveys and electrofishing surveys. Uh, we ended up removing a total of about 5,000 crayfish out of about uh, 12,500 that we captured in total. Um, we also marked crayfish with pit tags uh, in the control reach. And so if they were 20 millimeters or larger, if they were smaller, we did a, we, we punched a hole in their telson so that, uh, we could at least get a, a mark recapture hit on them, uh, but not individual identities. Um, and we also put this in-stream reader, uh, pit tag reader that we custom designed with Martian Associates over in Arizona. Uh, that went directly in between the two reaches so we can get an idea of how much migration we had from downstream into the upstream. Um, I was kind of curious if we had some sort of a, a, a density vacuum that crayfish sensed and tried to fill. Uh, the 20, my sense from 2020 data where we punched crayfish telesons uh, was that the, did not occur. We didn't have a single crayfish that we marked recaptured upstream in the suppression reach in 2020. In 2021, we had about 50,000 hits from crayfish crossing this. And it was a lot of times it was a resident loiterer that would go there and hang out for a week or two um, on or near the, the reader. But we had about 250 crayfish that crossed that boundary uh, and we recovered many of them in the suppression reach. Um, so they move far and fast. We also found crayfish that we released in the control reach downstream after we marked them or after we had recaptured them. And then we recovered them the next day, 250 meters upstream. Uh, that happened on more than one occasion. Um, so in, in less, than, less than 24 hours in those cases, they moved 250 meters upstream. Um, this is the onshore data logger or offshore data logger for that uh, in-stream reader. Uh, so we came out every week, changed the battery and, uh, and recovered data from the data logger. Um, 
And so we were able to get some real-time hits and uh, understand what was happening, um, which was re really useful to, to adjust on the fly to our, our suppression regime. Uh, so later on in the season, we started doubling the traps we had in the suppression reach to, to try to hammer them harder because we had evidence that they were, they were infiltrating uh, pretty quickly. Um, so this is uh, this is ongoing data data analysis that we're that we're conducting right now. So next steps here are to start calculating uh, aquatic community responses. So as part of the suppression efforts and all those surveys, we have fish data as well. Uh, we uh, uh, for every trip trapping effort, we conducted a 24-hour trap analysis where we measured uh, every fish and counted every invertebrate that was in the trap, uh, in addition to the crayfish. Um, and so we want to calculate some community metrics like even uh, richness, evenness, diversity indices uh, as response variables to crayfish suppression. Uh, we're currently finishing the stable isotope submission to, uh, to our in-house lab at UNM. Um, and we should have some of that data coming back presently and all of it by March, uh, we hope. Uh, we need to calculate the crayfish demographic response to the suppression. Um, through the time and uh, also apply what we've learned from uh, our mortality study to get an uh, accurate population estimate. Uh, and then lastly, we have a, a lot of crayfish spatial ecology data. Um, we, Martian Associates was kind enough to lend us uh, a, a handheld pit tag reader that we modified into um, a, a wand that we can go do these in-stream surveys. And so we conducted two to three of these a week for about three months. And so we have, uh, we recovered about 550 crayfish from that, that moved anywhere along a two kilometer stretch of the stream. Um, and so I've started cleaning that data, but getting it analyzed um, is, is one of the next steps here. Okay, so the third thing uh, we were looking at for our study is understanding the magnitudes of crayfish interaction. Uh, so we can look at this through mesocosm studies. So for this, we uh, installed, this is, this is Tom helping me inoculate with some plants um, in mid-March uh, when we kicked off these studies. Um, here's our experimental design. So we had three treatments for our mesocosms where we inoculated with zero crayfish, uh, three crayfish for a low density of crayfish and 10, 10 crayfish for our high density treatments. This, each, each of these mesocosms was about a half meter squared. So it's about six crayfish per meter squared and 10 crayfish per meter squared for these treatments. Um, these mesocosms have a base as well that helps keep the crayfish from going in or out underneath since they burrow. Um, and we utilize that to, uh, to conduct these in-stream uh, monitorings as well. So we took identical bases, installed them into the stream and uh, took the same response variables or response uh, metrics data from those as well. So we ended up with two extra uh, pseudo treatments that can sort of scale up was the idea, our mesocosm findings to the reach level um, with the ultimate goal of scaling up our mesocosms and reach level to the landscape level in our fourth project. So um, our original plan was to do this for, for 16 weeks. Uh, it took a little longer to get these installed uh, uh, without them washing out or, um, or uh, sediment washing out. So we got them going uh, finally in mid-March and started sampling on March 21st. Uh, we ended up getting 12 full weeks in. Um, the last, so we took emergence uh, insect samples where we acquired abundance of aquatic insects that emerge uh, every, every four weeks from the beginning until the end. At the end, we also uh, sampled juvenile crayfish that had infiltrated, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and we conducted soap pipe sampling for benthic and, and uh, water column invertebrates uh, at the end. Um, this is a, what a completed and installed mesocosm looked like. So we had these uh, we had these covered with uh, mosquito netting to make sure no invertebrates were going in or out that we didn't want, um, and make sure birds weren't coming in here and picking off. There's a resident great blue herons that love to eat crayfish. We didn't want them messing with this. 
Um, and we also want to make sure that garter snakes the, and fish that are here, the TNE species, didn't have a way of getting into this and getting stuck. So these are all wrapped around, you'll see with this eighth inch mesh uh, hardware cloth. Uh, and we have it zipped up. Uh, we sort of lashed it to the bottom to make sure there wasn't any gaps that snakes could get into and die. Um, and so fortunately, we were very successful with that. We didn't have any TNE species die. You'll be happy to know. Um, and uh, we, this is what it looked like when we were sampling with the emergence traps. So our emergence traps float on the top. They fit in directly. Uh, any, any aquatic larvae that emerges adults come out of here. And the only place for them to go is out the top into the sample vial that has uh, ethanol. And so they're just ready to go for us, put in a freezer out of the field site and, uh, analyze in the lab. So the first result that we didn't take, uh, we didn't take direct data on quantitative data on, but we have photos to, to illustrate the point here is that crayfish definitely affected vegetation, uh, which is a well-known, well-documented um, aspect of crayfish ecology. From the beginning of the experiment, we inoculated about a third of the sediment that we put back into these mesocosms with vegetation that was on the bank where we installed it. So we set aside these sections of sod uh, and then replace them into each mesocosm so that through the season it had what would have been growing in that location in the stream. At the end of week 12, the high crayfish treatments all looked like this. In fact, this was the most vegetated of the high crayfish treatments. The other ones looked like they were, they were just completely, uh, they were zero scape. Um, the low crayfish treatments and uh, zero crayfish treatments were largely indistinguishable from each other as far as vegetation went, um, which was an interesting result. And and sort of speaks to our invertebrate abundance coming up here. So um, a priori, we expected that Trichoptera and Chironomid and Ephemeroptera were gonna be pretty important players. And that turned out to be the case. Uh, they were the most abundant uh, uh, emergent invertebrates that we had. Um, here I've broken out Chironomids, which are a kind of a, a midge uh, from all the other flies. So this is all other diptera minus Chironomids here on the top right. Um, and this was a kind of an interesting and unexpected result that in all four of these, the low crayfish uh, treatments had the highest invertebrate abundance uh, coming out of there throughout most of the study and always at the end of the study. Um, so that was, that was, that was unexpected. We, we have a couple of hypotheses that would be interesting to test moving forward from this that it might be a predatory release, that there's a, an invertebrate predator of these, uh, of these invertebrates that crayfish eat preferentially. And so their, their natural predator is gone and we see their abundance increase. Another thing um, uh, might be a nutrient influx from crayfish. So I'll talk about this again in a minute, but uh, Sabo et al in 2013 found that Crayfish can actually uh, mobilize novel resources. They, they, in the San Pedro River, they incorporate um, salt cedar preferentially where nothing else utilizes that through their experiments. Um, and so maybe there's something similar is happening here where crayfish are mobilizing a resource and making that available to the invertebrates um, at a density where they're not creating uh, a strong um, predation pressure, but a strong enough nutrient influx uh, that's one possible explanation as well. Um, we did not end up with four or six uh, six mesocosms per treatment by the end of the experiment. We had two that went out the window, and I just wanted to show this one because it was the wildest thing I've ever had happen to me in the field. Where I came to work one day, and from a distance on the hill, I could see that something looked weird about this mesocosm. So the whole time I'm walking towards it, it just looks worse and worse and worse. And it turns out a bear had tried to get up onto this cut bank and using this as a stepping stone. There were claw marks straight through the top of the uh, mosquito netting. And then he left us a present right next to it, some evidence, a calling card. He was indeed there. Um, he broke all the, he broke three welds on our, on, on this and it was just totally unusable. Uh, we were able to recover the crayfish from this, which is good. They hadn't escaped, but um, another one was destroyed by either elk or cattle. Uh, it was similarly mangled and unusable. But for the most part, all of them survived um, and all of my anxiety was unfounded. <laughs> okay, so our next steps with this, um, we have those, those blanks, those pseudo replications from the reach level. 
all of the invertebrates, uh, we just finished counting those. I haven't, had, I haven't added them to any of our analyses. So that's next step is get those in and see what the, what the response to emergent invertebrates uh, is to our suppression reach efforts. Um, also, we had, I mentioned this earlier, we had intrudal, intruder larval crayfish. So our eighth inch mesh wasn't enough to keep out larval crayfish in the earliest days. Um, and we had them invade uh, most of our mesocosms, which ended up being kind of a blessing in disguise. It ended up being a cool uh, extra response variable where we can see what crayfish, what adult crayfish densities, uh, how that plays out with, with smaller crayfish densities because they are known to be cannibalistic and they're territorial, uh, aggressive towards each other. Um, and so we just finished counting those as well. We have, uh, those are all getting put in the museum. Um, and so we wanna know what the response of larval crayfish looked like and uh, whether we need to include it as a covariate in our response to those mesocosm treatments because the density that we planned was not the density in the end of crayfish because of these larval crayfish uh, intruding. Um, we haven't analyzed the stovepipe samples. It's a lot of larval invertebrates uh, from, from the benthos that need to get uh, counted. Uh, so the plan is to do that here in 2020. Um, that's a, a bonus metric. So if we can get it in, I'll be thrilled. If we don't, um, it's okay. Uh, and we're wrapping this up along with the next one to uh, present results at the Gila Symposium in February. So that's the next step for this. Okay, and our last, uh, our last portion of the project here is to scale up uh, crayfish effects to the landscape scale. Uh, so this is leveraging a data set from Keith Guido, Dave Probes, Tom Turner, uh, over a 10 year period. Uh, they sampled from 12 sites for invertebrates, but we have 12 sites that have also crayfish abundance. So we're looking, gonna be looking at just those 12 sites for this uh, data set. Most of the last fall has been uh, spent prepping this data set, cleaning it and making sure um, we had all the right taxonomic levels that we wanted. We're over 2 million invertebrates, 120,000 fish, 21,000 crayfish. Um, and we just got that good to go. And we're starting some analyses, which I'm thrilled to share with you. So first pass that we did is to look at overall community structure. This is a really busy plot uh, to illustrate a point is that the, uh, the invertebrate communities don't vary that much from site to site uh, across the 10 years. And so every one of these ellipses uh, represents uh, communities that group together based on this multivariate analysis. Essentially, every point is a sample, uh, a sample year at a certain plot or a certain um, site. Um, and based on the composition of that community, uh, we end up with these ellipses. The further they are apart, the more different the communities are, uh, the more they pancake on top of each other, the more similar they are. So first glance, first pass, we don't see a big difference in these communities. Um, however, since we just got back our musicosm data, we decided to start looking and generate some hypotheses based on what we might expect based on the response from chironomids and diptera, trichoptera, the femoroptera. Um, so we found in our musicosms that the low, again, the low uh, crayfish density ended up with the highest invertebrate abundance in all cases. Um, and so based on this, we can sort of generate a few expected uh, trends that we would see and, and get some a priori hypotheses going uh, uh, with this data. So I'm gonna present a few plots here with crayfish abundance on the x-axis and vertebrate abundance on the y-axis. Um, these are a little bit different from our mesocosms because these are all in-stream uh, invertebrates rather than ones that have emerged. Um, but if we find, so, so we could see an upward trend a straight linear response where crayfish abundance increases and vertebrate abundance increases. Um, and you can imagine this, we do a few things, maybe a predatory release uh, where crayfish are eating a predator of the invertebrates that we're interested in. Um, could be again, that nutrient influx hypothesis where crayfish are liberating uh, uh, new novel resources into the food web and that increases the abundance uh, of invertebrates. Um, could be something to do with, with habitat, uh, you know, crayfish are habitat engineers um, and your ecosystem engineers, pardon me. And, and it could be that maybe their effect on the ecosystem isn't all bad. Maybe they create novel habitat. Plausible reasons for that to increase. 
uh, we could see it decrease, which is what you might expect. So that as crayfish abundance goes up and vertebrate abundance goes down, um, that would be due to the opposite reasons, right? So maybe crayfish are eating these invertebrates that we're interested in and that decreases their abundance. Um, maybe crayfish are nutrient thieves and they're actually hogging and, and somehow not liberating, uh, but they're a nutrient sink in the system. Or it could be that they're degrading the habitat such that the invertebrates um, abundance can't increase. We could also have these more complicated uh, interactions, which is what we might expect from our mesocosm results, where the high crayfish abundance um, uh, clearly decreased in vertebrate abundance, but uh, the low crayfish abundance, low crayfish density, ended up actually improving or increasing in vertebrate abundance. Um, and you might see some groups like predators, for instance, if, if uh, this hypothesis is because of a predatory release, we might see some predatory invertebrates that have this response where the highest crayfish density, it might increase because there's a, a, a reciprocation in the food web, some such thing. So there's a lot of reasons that things might happen uh, that we might see some of these different patterns. Um, and the first step was to go and look. So a couple of caveats about this data set. Um, we uh, pooled sampling events from February through June for this um, into two seasons um, based on our mesocosm data being from the same season. So these could be as uh, relevant as possible to the mesocosm responses. Uh, we also, I wanted to test to see if there's difference in the sites. Six of these sites occurred lower down in the, in the main uh, Cliffhula Valley and six of them are higher up uh, headwater or upper main stem. Um, and so the first big result that you see is that the, all of the higher elevation sites on the left of each plot have a much orders of magnitude lower crayfish abundance in general. Um, so crayfish, crayfish really like it down in the valley um, and they're more hit or miss up in the, up in the upper uh, headwaters. So the other thing is you see a mix of those, of those proposed um, responses. So we see some mix. So this is uh, density dependent interactions here from chironomids and ephemeroptera, um, and also density dependent here with diptera. Um, but interestingly, trichoptera don't have a density dependent thing uh, response. Um, so this is kind of our next step. These are hot off the press uh, graphs. We're still working to figure out how to interpret these um, and, and looking forward to figuring out what's going on with this. Uh, we're going to do some more analyses with a fish data set. So, so uh, we have, like I said, over 120,000 fish over the 10-year period. Um, and we're, uh, we also need to calculate the community metrics, the evenness, richness, diversity uh, as response variables. Um, and then one of the first results that we saw with the, um, the ordination on the fish is that uh, the fish communities appear to be driven by non-native influence. And so we need to figure out how to deal with that statistically when we move forward for our hypothesis testing. Um, this is all stuff we're gonna be working on over the next couple of weeks so that we can present at the Natural History of the Gila Symposium coming up in February. Um, so that's where we are with everything. Um, appreciate everybody being here. I, I look forward to any questions you have. Hopefully there's some time for that. Um, and I got to make sure I thank especially my field and lab help from Ron, Taylor, Jimena, uh, Gwen, and Riley have been a huge help. But I also had a litany of volunteers that came out and helped me, helped me eat crayfish um, throughout the, the year. So thank you to everyone there too. Awesome. Thank you for that, Gregor. Um, it's going to be sarcastic, sarcastic and say, is that it? <laughs> There's a whole lot of information in there. Um, lots of exciting work. Um, Tom, first, if you have any follow-up comments, uh, anything you want to add before we just open it up? Gregor, there was a couple of, um, of questions in the chat as you were speaking about the dimensions of the removal and the control reach and the number of uh, the total number of crayfish that you re that you contacted yeah. versus the number that you removed. And if you could clarify that a little bit, that would be I great. can. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was surprised myself that that slide wasn't there uh, when I got to that part. I thought I had a conceptual framework uh, portion of that. Um, so there were two, two reaches, one where we always replaced and one where we always removed that were about 300 meters or 275 meters long. 
This year, we captured a total of about 13,000 crayfish between the two reaches total. We removed, um, I'll have to go back here to get that exact number, but it was uh, close to 5,000 crayfish from the removal reach this year, which means we had about 9,000 that we recovered from the control reach. And I will say if we recovered a crayfish that was pit tagged in the removal reach, which happened often, we took it back to the control reach and released it. We didn't remove that uh, as far as collecting it. Um, but hopefully that answers the question. Was that from Clint? It was. Yeah. Clint, do you have any follow-up question on that? Uh, no follow-up, just if anybody was interested, I was doing the math on the side and that's like 20-ish or so crayfish per meter stream, which is pretty, I don't know if it's surprising or not, because I know these streams have a ton of crayfish. Yeah, it yeah it's hard to overstate the densities out there in 2021. It was amazing. I haven't seen that many crayfish in a long time. Um, follow up on the numbers again, Gregor, the total number from 2020 that were uh, was 1970. Thanks. Yeah, it was, it was a wild difference. So any other questions or comments from the group? Fairly small group here. Feel free to turn your video on if you'd like to unmute yourselves. Just come on and ask questions, make a comment. Um, floor is open. Hey. Hey, Gregor, this is Bill Stewart. I, I just had a question about the, the functional groups, or if you could explain, maybe I missed it when you were talking about the isotope yeah. stuff. Like what, what those different categories are exactly? Yeah, definitely. So um, we have, I'll go left to right here. Uh, can everybody, can you see my mouse? Yeah. Okay, good. Yep. Uh, all right, so this light blue is in-stream C3 plants. Um, and this dark blue are, are riparian C3 plants. So these are uh, macrophytes uh, in stream emergent vegetation, um, like ranunculus and uh, uh, things like that, Veronica. Um, and this was oak, juniper. Um, at this site, this isn't the no most normal riparian, so it doesn't have any willow um, or um, cottonwood in the riparian. This is sort of pinion juniper scrub straight up to the stream here. So that's what this uh, riparian C3 group is. Um, here we have filamentous algae, uh, largely growing in the center of the stream, sort of in higher flow areas. Um, here we have um, uh, epilithic algae, and this is more of a community. It's not just algae, this is more bacteria, fungus, uh, algal mats on the rocks. Uh, and then this is a C4 grass, the only C4 grass that we had at the site. Um, which was kind of surprising. And this grew on the side of the stream, grew into the stream as well, shot rhizomes into the stream. Um, the crayfish here, uh, this is all crayfish ranging from, I think a carapace length of 10 to 40 or so. Um, and then this is fish. So fish present at this site are um, both suckers, Nora and uh, uh, desert sucker, um, loach minnow, uh, spiked it, or not spiked it, sorry, um, longfin dace and uh, speckled dace. Um, and then so groups that you don't see in here are the invertebrates. That was the last trade that I submitted last year. And then the isotope lab shut down because of COVID. Um, and that's going to be uh, ranging from uh, larval femoroptera to um, uh, uh, predaceous diving beetles, some, some predatory. So there's some grazers uh, and some predaceous invertebrates that will be added to this plot. And Bill, you know, one of the important things about the isotope data is under the different treatment conditions, you might expect if there's strong biotic interactions between let's say crayfish and some other taxon like a fish, you might expect that the resource use of that may shift and so this is going to be an important response variable uh, in terms of understanding the biotic impacts of crayfish on the food web itself. Yeah. And the, and the good so, news, the good news about this is that, you know, these sources, we can really discriminate these super well. And I have to tell you, that is not true in every stable isotope study I've ever seen. Uh, so, asks, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and so this is, this is sort of control results from the, Control exactly. Well, and then uh, that's 
this is this is currently from both so this is but this okay. is all taken before we before we <laughs> conducted the study this is the yeah this okay. is before status and so this is just to see what the what the baseline especially the primary producers uh this is the first pass to see is our experimental design going to work and so far it looks like yes which is okay here um and i'll answer drew's question and also add one thing that we're interested in not just the in-stream aquatic effects but how that ripples out to the to the riparian consumers of aquatic resources uh, this year we added spiders to the mix as well so we have uh snakes uh garter snakes two species of garter snakes but a third is present at the site but we only got two this year um that's narrow-headed garter snake and the um wandering garter snake lizards we have uh tree lizards so eurosaurus and natus uh two species of scoloporus um which is cow's eye and clark eye and then two whiptail species um sonora and uh um extinguished and so we're interested in whether uh those individuals that are present and feeding in the removal reach are shifting their isotopic niche width or niche space there's a number of metrics that we're going to analyze uh as a response to this isotope data but whether those riparian consumers shift in their resource use as well Gregor, there was a there's another question in the chat from Russell, um, and the question is: Removal efforts of brook trout have shown a compensatory response. Any idea if the increase in crayfish captured from 2020 uh, to 2021 was a compensatory response uh, in reproduction? It could could be. Um, it seemed to me, based on the low reproduction in 2020. And past years that I've been out at this and other sites with, with uh, for snake work where we get crayfish as well, it seems like crayfish reproduction is just hit or miss. It, it's boom or bust, and they'll either get knocked out or they won't. And so this is, seems like a year where they didn't. Um, that would, that's my intuition. I don't know, what do you think, Tom? Yeah, I think I agree with that. Um, you know, I, it's it's important to think about density dependence and compensatory responses. But in this case, I you know, it's interesting that you know when you when you had those flow events, you know, you it essentially really looks like it impacts the density of the younger crayfish in the sense that it just moves them down. It physically moves them out of the out of the the system, and um, you know, and you know, I think there's tremendous reproductive capacity of crayfish. And that's the, and you know, I think uh, uh, we haven't yet gotten any sort of evidence of density dependence, which would be really important. You know, if you expect a compensatory response, you should also have at high density, some density dependence. And so, um, well, that's something we could definitely keep in mind and take a look at, Russell. Yeah. An interesting comment on, on Leland's comment. Um, I, I spoke to, I don't know if Dave is on this call, but I spoke to Dave Probst because he's been at this site since the 80s with a brief, a brief lapse in the 90s, late 80s and early 90s. Um, crayfish were not there for the five or six years in a row he was at the Tula Rosa. Um, and then they were there in strong numbers uh, starting in the early 2000s. Um, and that seems to have increased. And as we all know, drought has increased in the, those last 20 years. So there's anecdotal evidence that, that the decrease in, in rain flow or rain, rainfall and flow events. It's probably not good news. You know, and Lee too, um, one of the things that from that long-term monitoring data set is there's a few really dry years and a few really wet years in there. And it might be interesting to compare, you know, kind of break the data out uh, that way and take a look and see, you know, the expected response would be lower, crayf lower crayfish densities when you get a good, you know, a good seasonal flow, either a, a you know, spring flow pulse or a monsoon flow. So I think that's really, it's something that could be tackled to some degree. Yeah. So thank you both. I wanna make sure that we wrap on time. So I want to, gonna push us forward here, uh, but Gregor, Tom, if, um, most folks would have your email already, but if, if you both be willing to drop your email address, in the chat box in case there are follow-up questions on that be good. I think there's a, a few new folks here. 
Um, so Gregor, especially, thank you so much for your work and for the presentation. There's a ton of data. I've been chatting with Christy the whole time. Like this data set's awesome on various steps. So really excited to see where, where you're able to go. So yeah, really impressive work. Um, and Tom, great leadership on this project. Um, excited about it. Us um, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, more questions, but I'm going to go ahead and table those for now. Um, but I want to say thanks everyone for joining us for this uh, research update from the UNM group. Uh, next month, we'll be doing it again. Uh, we'll actually have two different presentations next month. Uh, we'll hear from the UT San Antonio team um, about crayfish, again, in the Gila and, and crayfish distribution in the Gila, Gila and Little Colorado River basins. And then we'll hear from the Virginia Tech team about their multi-species simulation uh, research to support management of aquatic invasive species. So thank you for that. Uh, well, yeah, hopefully we'll see you all again next month. Great. Thanks, yeah. everybody. No problem. And we do have some updates that we were going to include, but we'll plan to just send those out via email. Uh, one thing I will note, um, Gregor asked that I share information about the, the Gila Symposium. So you all should have that um, already in your inbox. And if you have questions about that, you can follow up with Gregor as well. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and close it out and look forward to seeing everyone again.